Welcome back to Documentary First, an inside look at a documentary filmmaker's journey. I'm Jason Rugg, filling in indefinitely for Josh Lindsay. <laughs> and joining us is our documentary filmmaker, Christian Taylor. Thank you, Jason Rugg. I'm standing in for Josh Lindsay indefinitely. Great to see you. <laughs> He'll be back eventually, we think. <laughs> yeah, we haven't really announced that. Uh, so I'm going to make this formal announcement. Um, Josh did let us know last week that he really does need to step back for a little bit just because his work has gotten really busy. Uh, and so he's taking a little hiatus. We're not sure if he's going to come back. We'll see. Um, hopefully he will. Uh, anyway, Josh, we love you. We're thankful for your dedicated service over the last three years. And uh, we wish you the best as you try to take care of your own life and family. Uh, and we'll see you again soon, I'm sure. Anyway, now back to you, Jason. Yeah. And then we also have a special secret guest. Secret? Is it secret or is it like, you know, just kind of on the down low for right now? It's on the down low. I mean, if you're watching, you're going to see he's here. If you're listening, you'll have no <laughs> idea. We're not going to reveal who he is right now. Uh, so you'll have to wait for that later in the show. Well, speaking of the show, um, you want to get it started? Yeah, let's do this. Okay, so um, let me just give you a quick update. Uh, there has been a lot going on this week, which is actually very exciting. I am going to lead with our most exciting headline, which is we're going to be on Amazon. So everybody has been waiting for this for a really long time. It's actually happening. Looks like we're going to have some pre-sales um, happening on October 4th, and then we will launch on November 1st. So I want to give a huge shout out to Virgil Films. They've been working very hard behind the scenes, making sure that our film is ready for distribution to the streaming services. Uh, they've also been, you know, making all the deals and trying to get us on many different platforms. Uh, right now, the ones we know about for sure are Apple TV, Amazon, Vudu, Vimeo On Demand, Google Play, uh, which I think is also YouTube movies or something like that. Um, and yeah, I think that's it to start with, but it's a great start. There will be hopefully more kind of coming down the pike. Uh, but the most wonderful news really is Amazon because now people can easily find us with a platform that they're familiar with. Um, most of our audience is not really, you know, on Apple TV. So this makes it a little bit more user friendly. So we're super happy about that. Um, you hardcore Patreon supporters and podcast listeners, we need you to know we're going to need your help during this launch. Um, we have to put up new comments for iTunes and Apple TV, and we need to do that from people that have seen the film and are strong supporters. So we're going to ask you to do that and and do some other things. There's still some complications that we have to work through, um, but but we're very hopeful that everything will go as planned. One of the complications is I've been working on this week uh, has been those uh, things that we have to do legally to be able to, uh, to release. And the first one is to have errors and omissions insurance. Um, for those of you who don't know what that is, its nickname is E&O. Uh, it is a standard in the industry for anyone that is a distributor, but also for a producer that is has a film. And I've talked about this before. Uh, the reason for it in the industry is to protect anyone that has a work out there. If they are being sued by someone that says, you've defamed me, this is wrong about me, you've taken this without, I mean, there are a whole bunch of different reasons. Um, however, just about everybody I've talked to said, you know, it's really ridiculous to have it now. It's nothing, you know, no, there are no really claims that have ever happened. I mean, I've had distributors tell me for 30 years they've never had this issue come up, uh, but you still got to do it. So that's where we are. Uh, I did have a company in California, which was an insurance broker, get a bunch of quotes back for me. So I have a solid idea now about how much I'm going to have to pay for this E&O insurance. And the lowest quote came in today at $3,250, something like that. So that's a set fee we're going to have to pay no matter what. And then I locked in all of the rights for the uh, music that I have to uh, come up with. And that's going to be around $3,000. So, you know, we'll be between uh, 6,500 probably, um, I think somewhere around there when all is said and done. Uh, and really the biggest thing we're going to need right now is we need, um, 
our supporters to come out and get us over this finish line uh, because I'm trying to figure out how to pay for that right now before November 1st. I have to have it done before November 1st. So we're writing a newsletter. We're going to hope to launch it in the beginning of the week, maybe get one more push for donations, um, you know, for people to kind of help us financially get over that hump. And I'm trying to think of what else happened this week. Um, I mean, those so, are the biggest things. Yeah, Jason. I actually have a question about e you know, insurance. How long is that? Uh, if, if you pay, you know, the three thousand dollars, how yeah. long does that last? Is that Good a question. year, five years, six months? Right. It it is for five years. You have to have it the length of your, um, you know, whatever your contract is. Hmm. Um, at I mean, the minimum length, uh, and we will have to renew it no matter what if we're going to have this movie out there and the i think it's something like and i don't have it in front of me but something like it has to be between one million and three million in coverage and there's probably a deductible it's like any other insurance um but i will have to to pay it again in five years wow yeah wow you start to understand why some movies just kind of slip through the cracks where it's like, yeah, we're not making enough to cover all of these random little expenses. And it's like that just isn't going to be up anywhere for anyone to see. It, yeah. And it's the difference between an independent producer who owns their property and somebody like a Netflix or you know any streaming service that has a lot of money. They can continue to kind of do those things and wrap them into what they're already doing for somebody like me. I'm going to, you know, even if I don't change distribution, even if my distribution contract is for 15 years, these things I will constantly have to pay to renew. Now, the hope is that eventually the movie will begin to make some money uh, and I'll be able to cover at least some fees. Um, that's the hope. And that would have been the case were we to get paid from the stuff that we did with FFS. Um, so we just kind of got the short end of the stick on that, obviously. Right. Yeah. Now, there's one other super exciting uh, piece of news. Uh, it has to do with our secret guest. Uh, we have somebody that's joining the Documentary First team for the first time. So excited about it. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Robbie Davis. Woo! Woo! <laughs> I was hey, expecting Robbie. like applause and lots of noise. But, you know, our the two of you, I, yeah, you're doing a great job. <laughs> we did our, our listeners best. listeners are applauding. <laughs> exactly. Applauding, yeah. I'm telling you. <laughs> uh, that's great. We're so happy to have you, Robbie. Uh, I'm just going to tell people real quick. I have known Robbie's family, well, his father in particular, since way before he was born. Uh, his father and I were friends in high school, actually. So same age, same year. Uh, his father, Rob Davis, his parents taught at my high school, the Stony Brook School. And Rob, we just couldn't get rid of him. He just kept coming back and visiting, and he loved theater, and I was in the theater program. So uh, we met, we became friends, and even though he wasn't at the school when I was, um, we we just never lost touch. And uh, I so I remember when he got married, Mary's Rob, Robbie's mom, and had Robbie. And so uh, I've known his family for a long time. He comes highly recommended, everybody. You're going to love him. Uh, if you're not looking, he's adorable, just as adorable as Jason. Uh, not that that matters, but... Uh, Anyway, Robbie, welcome. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about yourself other than what I just shared. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, I, I've been, it's funny. I'm, there are a lot of things going on in the background of just life right now. So I've been giving my elevator pitch of who I am a lot lately. <laughs> uh, but I was uh, born and raised in New Jersey, right outside New York City. Uh, I went to Grove City College, which is an hour north of Pennsylvania, or north, north of Pittsburgh. It's in Pennsylvania. And uh, studied communications, did a lot of theater there. Um, moved down to Pittsburgh for a year, loved that. And right when I thought I was going to go to law school and, you know, everything was planned out. I was going to move to Washington, D.C. And as everybody planning to go to law school, move to Washington, D.C. does, moves down to Oxford, Mississippi, and joins a nationally syndicated radio show. Uh, and so I have, <laughs> I have been here for four years and like a month now. Um, and I've loved it. I've, I've done everything from the basic production where – the grunt work where people have you know thrown audio at me and said, hey, cut this up, um, to interviewing some really just incredible individuals. Um, and it's a privilege. I, I The best way I can kind of describe the show is um, it's a talk show where the host isn't the star. Uh, he talks maybe six, seven minutes entire, the entire thing. Um, and we let the guests tell their story, tell the story of somebody else. And um, I, I don't know. It's a neat ethos, you know? 
letting somebody else speak for a while, which is not something you get, not just on the radio, but in, uh, just our culture in general. So that's kind of what brought me here. And yeah, so I, I, I love it. And, you know, it's funny enough, you know, Christian, you were here and we know, ended up knowing a lot of the same people, but not through our other connection, which was yeah. my father. Yeah, so it's interesting. Um, I did uh, go to Oxford. Uh, many of you who've listened to this for a really long time, way, way back, I made a trip to Oxford, Mississippi to meet with Lee Habib, who was at that time really, uh, he's the host, I guess you would say, of one of our American stories. And um, he he wasn't at that time, didn't feel like he uh, was on board with what we were doing, didn't want to support us. Uh, no, you know, I wasn't offended. It's always, uh, it's just not for everybody. Um, and I didn't meet you at the time, Robbie. You no. were not working there at the time. You were still in college. Uh, and, you know, people may not know this, but I mean, my husband went to law school at Ole Miss. We lived in Oxford for three years. And of course, I'm from Mississippi, so and I'm an Ole Miss Rebel fan. So we were uh, in Oxford all the time. My sons were, my second son was born there and baptized in College Hill Presbyterian Church, where Robbie attends. Okay. Um, so we just had a lot of things in common. And as we just started talking, uh, Robbie, it sounds like to me you want to kind of take something. Uh, and make it your own. Um, yeah. And you really love this industry that we're in, and you have an opportunity to do that with this podcast. I was explaining to Robbie, we're in this transitional phase with the podcast where um, I really would like to make it better. We want to improve our Patreon offering and you know broaden our reach with the podcast, but there's just not a lot of bandwidth on my team to be able to do that. But Robbie, let's talk real quick about the possibilities that you see of, of what we can do. Yeah. Well, uh, we were talking just yesterday about some of the neat things we could do because you know, there's so many um, different things that are covered on the podcast already. There's the filmmaking side of things. There's the historical um, storytelling. And those are almost in and of itself two different things. Uh, so it's figuring out, hey, do we separate those? Do we maybe highlight, go off one week or another and, and highlight uh, each one separately? It's, it's um, right now very much brainstorming. Uh, I, I don't pretend to come in and go say, Hey, I know exactly what, what we can do with this thing. But, um, I mean, it's, it's, you're already, um, this is about service. You're, you're doing this so other people can hear what your process not only has been, but is currently. Um, and the storytelling is, I mean, it's, again, that's beautiful. It's it's what drew me to our American stories. It's, it's very much a, a part of what you do. And I think that, um, yeah, that, that's something that, that draws me, you know, storytelling is something that's so powerful. Um, so yeah, I, I, again, I know that doesn't really answer, Hey, what are the things that we can do? Um, but that's because it's very, very early in, in yeah, the process. Today's like your first day on the job. So, exactly. yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but I do want to give a sneak peek to our, um, our podcast listeners and in particular, our Patreon supporters, uh, they write in and give me their thoughts and ideas whenever I have, you know, my next big idea. Uh, so I'm going to throw this one out at you. I'm going to give credit to this, to Ben Fife and our business operations guy. He talked to me about there being a niche in the industry we could fill uh, that sort of merges what we're already doing uh, with something we could do. And that is we do have a lot of people that really love the World War II history stories that we bring to the table. Um, and, you know, and we're torn because we also have filmmakers that listen to this to learn about the filmmaking process. Um, and Ben's idea was, what if we brought some of those World War II history stories to the table or veterans? We've even had veterans on, um, but with some modern day military service members who have fought in Afghanistan or Iraq and can kind of bring that perspective um, and I've already kind of floated this balloon with some pretty awesome people and everybody thinks it's a great idea. So uh, if you think it's a good idea, would you be, you know, if you'd be interested in listening to some of that um, and us separating the history and the filmmaking, you know, just a tad, not a hundred percent, but uh, yeah, let me know. Uh, either write me at Christian or do at documentary first or 
Um, if you're in our Patreon, just send me a note. I'll write you back. Uh, so that's one idea we're kicking around. I'm sure Robbie has more. We want to bring some more guests on and just uh, diversify a little bit. So, But, you know, Robbie, you said you uh, really love stories and that you've been producing stories at Our American Stories. Do you have any you can share with us uh, just so we can kind of get a taste of what you've done in the past? Absolutely. Uh, one of my the first stories I ever told was I, I can't remember how I found her, um, but she's a an author out in Arizona, and she wrote a book on Judy Pearson, uh, or Judy Pearson is her name, and she wrote a book on Virginia Hall, and Virginia Hall is known as uh, Klaus Barbie, the butcher of Lyon, one of the you know worst SS guys uh, in World War II, um, referred to him at, her as I've got it here. I wrote it down because I thought it was that. Crazy. Uh, the most dangerous of all allied spies. Um, wow. And she, the story starts out where she is, uh, she graduates high school. She studies abroad in Paris and Vienna. This is the 1930s. Um, but her dream is to be a foreign service uh, officer. Uh, and they keep rejecting her. And it's mostly because she's a woman. I mean, the number of female uh, foreign service officers in the 1930s, you could actually count on one hand. Um, so she thinks, okay, I can't get in through the front door. I'm going to go in through the back. And so she starts working at um, U.S. embassies around the world. She's in Poland. She's in Turkey. Um, and she keeps applying. And they keep rejecting her. And while she's in uh, Turkey, she goes on a hunting trip. And she trips with the gun in her hand, shoots her left foot. Um, and they have to amputate from the knee down. So you'd think, okay, yeah, this woman's career is over at that point. Um, especially because there was a seven pound wooden leg uh, prosthesis that, that she had to walk around with. Uh, but that's not how she saw it. She's applied again and they rejected her because she was an amputee. Uh, and so she goes, okay, fine. I'm going to go over and help the French army and be an ambulance driver. Um, and so this is kind of as World War II begins. Um, and Gotta she, love that made, determination. Right? <laughs> yeah. like it's, it's crazy. And this is, this is even before she's officially, you know, serving in the war. And so she finally gets over there um, and she meets a uh, special operations executive officer, which uh, is, is, you know, she meets this guy in, in Britain and he says, no, you, you speak and, you know, you're highly educated. You speak French. How would you like to be, they say, how would you like to be a spy? And she goes, this, that's what I've wanted pretty much my entire life. Um, so they said, okay, we're going to send you over to France because uh, America hadn't joined the war yet. Um, she could go over as a journalist and work undercover. Um, and that's exactly what they did. They, she, they sent her over to Lyon, which was the center of the resistance. Uh, and she's an informant. Every British agent uh, who was sent over to central France came through her flat. Uh, she was that kind of the clearinghouse for all of these British intelligence officers. Um, and so she's helping downed fighter pilots. She's helping people who are, are being chased by the Gestapo. She's getting them out of the country um, to the point where this is, that's when Klaus Barbie comes in and he's, he's, you know, looking for her and they know her as the woman with a limp um, because of, you know, but, but they don't know who she is. Um, so then she's ushered out of the country. She's climbing through the Pyrenees mountains and her guy, her guide doesn't know that, she has this prosthesis. So she's stumbling through the snow and he's kind of like, what is this woman's problem trying to get her over these mountains? And at one point during, I love this, at one point during that incident, uh, she uh, telegraphs England and she nicknamed her leg Cuthbert for some reason. So she, she telegraphs, uh, Cuthbert has become quite tiresome. Um, and whoever that, that <laughs> telegraph operator was didn't know that that was a code name for her leg. So they said back that you should have him eliminated. <laughs> <laughs> so, so she gets back. Uh, she's arrested in Spain and is in a, a Spanish prison for six weeks. Um, and it can only get out because she, she, I mean, this, the crazy, the story is crazy. Um, she, there's a prostitute who, who is her cellmate. And so her cellmate then goes to the British embassy and gets her out. Um, she returns to England in 1943 and the OSS has started. The OSS is now in full swing with Wild Bill Donovan. And, uh, they, she goes, I, I want to go back. She's like, I, I just, I want to go send me back to France. And like, you, we can't, the, the, you know, Klaus Barbie already knows you exist. They know you have a limp. Like they, you can't go back. She goes, well, send me, send me back in disguise. 
And so then they dress her up as a, a, an old, you know, French peasant and they, they send her back and she ends up leading a resistance cell. They can't, they, this, these are crazy statistics that was over 1500 people. They killed 150 Nazis and captured 500. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. And so she, she got, she was awarded the member of the British empire, the Croix de Guerre and the distinguished service cross, uh, which is the American medal. And she is the only American woman in world war two to get that. And so she wow. gets back. Yeah. So she gets back. The OSS becomes the CIA. Um, and so she's kind of working with that. And she, at the ripe old age, as Judy puts it of 41, they, they they see her as old school and outdated. And so she's like, so she probably, you know, against her will, but she uh, retires in 1966, uh, 16 years earlier, 1950, she gets married. She retires to Maryland um, and, and is married to this French American man. They raise poodles, they garden. Um, and she passed away in 1982. But she's this, this wild story of like the, probably the, one of the, most accomplished spies in American history. Um, I mean, it's, it's just almost, it's wild. Yeah, it almost falls under the heading of you just can't make this stuff up. I mean, yeah. if this was if this was something someone was writing, that's not. I mean, you're you wouldn't even believe it if it was fictionalized. It's yeah. very difficult to believe it that it's actually true. Yeah, and it's it the the fact that not until I, I want to say it was early two thousands you couldn't find really any, you know, anything written on her. Yeah. And so Judy Pearson was one of the first people to do research on her. And it's, it's wild because she, what like, is the name of like, Judy Pearson's book? Oh, that's, that's a good question. Her book. Uh, Jason can look it up. Yes. That, <laughs> I should have, should have known. I think it's something like, um, the greatest, the greatest American female spy or like Virginia Hall. Uh, Jason, you, you can actually get what it's called and not just me guessing. Yeah, well, you know, I have always been super, super interested in spy stories. One of the reasons I love the Brave Dutch story that we're working on mm -hmm. is because it is the Dutch resistance, and it's basically all spy work. And it is women that are flying under the radar in the Netherlands. Uh, they're so brave and uh, just mind-blowingly courageous. I just uh, – and you would just never expect that they would have that fortitude. Um, yeah. so I'm super interested in that story. We'll have to, sounds like somebody should make a movie about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, tell me about it. That's, that's the first thing I, I, I was, when she was telling me, cause I did the interview, I'm sort of going, dude, like, has anybody made a movie of it? Cause this is crazy. <laughs> like you, you can just see it playing out. And yeah. What it, fact, what, I, what's I, I the title of the book? Gal yeah. Uh, the title is wolves at the door. The wolves true the story door. of America's greatest female spy. That's right. I'm well, glad you looked it up because I wasn't even close. <laughs> <laughs> no, awesome. but I th yeah. Go ahead. I think Gal Gadot was attached to a movie that they were going to make on Virginia Hall, but I don't think it ever came to fruition. Hmm. Well, thank you for introducing us to Miss Virginia Hall. It seems like everybody should know about this amazing lady. Sorry yeah. I didn't get to meet her. Um, so thank you for that. Uh you know, it's wonderful to have you here. I can't wait to see what you bring to the table. Um, you know, it really means a lot that you're willing to get your feet wet and your hands dirty. Uh, so we're looking forward to working with you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to, to being part of the team. It's, it's, it's fun already. Yeah. And this is, yeah, what, it's gonna how be many great. minutes in? Yep. 20? <laughs> It'll be great. All right, Jason. Well, do you have any questions, thoughts, short speeches? Complaints, even? <laughs> well, I have a lot of those, but I'll wait Critiques. for you to leave. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm really glad to have you here, Robbie. I Just this story, the fact that you just brought this with you is so cool, and I'm just so glad to, to have you be a part of the team. So, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Super, as they say in France. Well, <laughs> is it time for our new segment that's no longer new? <laughs> no, it's it's old hat at this point. Docu <laughs> view deja vu. Docu view deja vu. Docu view deja vu. Docu view deja vu. I felt left out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like can you say, say it? it? Docu view deja vu. Look at that.
at that. There you go. All right, you got Robbie. That faster than anyone else. <laughs> since you're new to this party, did you bring a documentary that you are interested in? In fact, I did. I watched it again last night in, in preparation for today. He is um, so prepared. <laughs> uh, I, the first time I saw it, I had to drive up to Memphis, uh, which is about an hour and a half away. Um, but it's it's the director is Edgar Wright, who's done uh, Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz, Baby Driver. I mean, he's he's I think he's my favorite director. He's he's incredible. Um, but the this it, it, actually I'll back up a little. He's my favorite director because he blends music and visuals so well. It's just like everything is choreographed. And so it's fitting that he did a documentary on a band. Um, it's called The Sparks Brothers, and the band is Sparks. And they've been around since the mid-1960s. Uh, it's a pair, of, uh, a pair of brothers, Ron and Russell Mayo. And they were born in California. They've had many different names of their band, Half Nelson being one of them. I can't. I didn't write all of their names down, but uh, I mean, this this has Neil Gaiman, Bjork, Mike Myers, the comedian, uh, Duran Duran, Beck, Flea from Red Hot Chili Peppers, Weird Al Yankovic, Amy Sherman Palladino, who wrote Gilmore Girls. Um, all of these people like adore Sparks, and they're all throughout this thing just talking about how um, one of the early lines is, if you're in a tour bus with a band, the conversation is eventually going to come around to Sparks. And they're this quirky, like they've reinvented themselves over and over. And if this is one of my favorite album titles of theirs, gratuitous sax and senseless violins. <laughs> so like that, if that doesn't tell you kind of where their <laughs> minds are at, um, but they were never big in the U S uh, but they were huge hit in, in England, like just massive. Um, and it's this, Awesome. I mean, it tracks them through the 60s to today, and they, they've made a movie, and it's a weird movie. It's called Annette. I, I don't know if I recommend it just because it's that weird, um, but it, it's at least, wor it's at least watch worth watching once. Um, but, I mean, it's, it's just a, a beautiful documentary. You've got black and white interviews, but they play with color at certain times in them. They have stop motion from clay to, like, cut out newspaper clippings that they move around. I mean, it's just... It, he's taken everything he's done in the you know feature film world that, and he's a writer director. And he ta he's taken all of that and put in this documentary. I mean, I'd I'd never heard of Sparks before. I went for him, and I'm glad he introduced me to the band because wow. it, it, it was a it was a great, excellent movie. Well, I've never even heard of the band. Didn't hear of the documentary. So super glad you brought that to the table. When oh. was this filmed? All right. And also, uh, I know you, because you mentioned in one of your docu view Deja Vu's, The Go-Go's. Yes. Um, and Jane Weedlin from The Go-Go's uh, dated, I believe it was Russell Mayle, and she's actually in the documentary as well. Ah. Uh -huh. Well, you know, it <laughs> yes. sounds like they then were in the, they were a contemporary with, um, with, oh, shoot, Concrete Jungle. Who sings that? Uh, message to you, Rudy. Uh, Jason. Oh, shoot. Uh, <laughs> okay. so Bob it's Marley Scott. does Concrete Jungle. Who does it? Bob Marley and the Whalers. No, no. no. Look up that. a message to you, Rudy. Okay. Anyway, this band, I can't believe I'm blanking on their name. It's because the I'm specials? too old. What? The Specials? Yes, The Special. <laughs> oh, my gosh. The Specials rock, um, literally. And they are contemporaries with The Clash. And mm. the Go-Go's dated one of the guys in The Specials. And so I do remember Jane Whedon talking about the diff that, that like punk rock scene in England during that time. So yeah. they were clearly, you know, in that. I, I'm sure I'll love this yeah. movie. No, they were, and they ha they talk about how they have one album that it's still that experimental rock, and it but it's still punk, and then the next one was when they reinvented themselves, and it's not like bubblegum pop, because again, it's that exper like you can never call experimental rock bubblegum pop, but like it's compl just this flip from that punk rock, and they were almost kind of like they've had many ups and downs, and that was certainly one of their downs in their wow. career when they came out with that album, they kind of almost eschewed from you know the punk scene. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I wonder if um, they, any of them are in the Go-Go's documentary because I know the specials yeah. are. Like I was blown away when I saw the specials in the Go-Go's doc. So, and I think even some of the police were in the Go-Go's doc because they were in that scene also. Um, 
So awesome. So when was it filmed and where can we watch it? Uh, I know it was released uh, 2021 because uh, I went, I know I remember going last year to see it and you can watch it on Netflix. It is on oh. Netflix. Okay. Good to know. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for bringing that. All right, Jason, yeah. you're up. All right. So mine has a little bit of a story as to why I watched it. Um, so the movie proposal podcast, we just recently did an episode on 13 lives, which is the Ron Howard movie about those, uh, the Thailand, uh, soccer team that got trapped in that cave during the flooding in 2018. Yes. Yeah. And so that was, uh, you know, a, a dramatization of it, you know, right. It's a, it's a true story, but being told as a, um, feature narrative. narrative film. And so Josh recommended uh, in that he said he watched the documentary from National Geographic um, called The Rescue. And I love that movie. I loved uh, 13 Lives so much. I went and watched the documentary about the actual event. And it is heartbreaking and incredible and <laughs> just really, really worth your time. If you if followed that story at all, if you remember the rescue and you know the the monsoon is coming and we only have a limited amount of time, it's just well. And wasn't the that where like um, the Tesla dude, what's his name? Oh yeah, <laughs> Elon Musk. Yeah. Elon Musk <laughs> wasn't he going to make like this thing to go and get them out? Is that the same story? Yeah, yeah. So he he proposed building a tank thing to put them in to to get them out, and it was um yeah, it it was basically impossible because you had to like as a person wriggle through holes that like, you know, yeah. you couldn't just like go straight through. You had to like climb through and, you know, you're scraping your tank and your chest and everything and your hands are all bloody after you come out. And it's, you know, a really rough time. And he's like, why don't we just build a tank that can hold a, an adult person <laughs> and put them in that? Sheesh. It's like, uh, no, no, man. Well, so I, I, I'm confused by the narrative. Um, Howard, uh, film that's called 13 lies if it's lies. a true story oh l-i-v-e-s yeah gotcha. lies ah, yep mm. i thought As it was in... going to be some expose on how <laughs> everything's lying <laughs> and this didn't no. really happen <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> no it's um it's 13 lives are, are stuck in that cave okay. and it's really interesting there's little things that you learn along the way like we knew okay yeah there's this soccer team stuck in there as soon as they found them some Thai Navy SEALs went in and stayed with them until they got them out. So there yeah, were actually that. 15 people in this cave, in this one little cave that's running out of oxygen <laughs> as they're trying to figure out how do we get them all out. <laughs> wow. And, all right. Yeah, it's, it's a fantastic documentary. I recommend, you know, watch 13 Lives or The Rescue. Watch them both. It's, it's a great, great ride. Super. <laughs> Where can people watch it? So 13 Lives is on Amazon Prime. Um, you have to have a Prime account to watch it right now. You can't, like, rent it or buy it yet. Um, it's still exclusive there. And then The Rescue is available on Disney+. Plus. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to stick with the band theme. Uh, so I thought it was cool that you brought a, a music doc today. Uh, I actually watched Count Me In last night. Uh, I was done with Cobra Kai, unfortunately, <laughs> sadly, I should say. So I, um, I was, you know, going around Netflix trying to figure out what to watch and it popped up. And I, you know, I was like, oh, I wonder if I'm going to like this. It started off in the beginning. I wasn't really sure. Uh, and really, it's not about one band. It's about drummers in a mm. band. And so it um, interviewed several drummers uh, from all different kinds of bands to talk about their experience, how they became drummers, what it was like to be a drummer, how their mind works, who the drummers are they've respected before, uh, what it's like to be in concert and their relationship with the audience. Uh, and as I got deeper and deeper into this doc, I grew so much respect and I really loved the history of the drummers that they admired. Um, and watching them perform and understanding how their mind works was just fascinating to me. So it was a very well done doc. I really loved how they, I, I liked the script. I liked how they laid it out. Uh, I thought the, you know, the cinematography was great. The, you know, the way they wove it together was really good. So if you like music, particularly if you like drums, I've secretly always wanted to be a drummer. 
uh, as you know, you know, the Go-Go's are my thing. And uh, with we, we got the beat, they had me. I really wanted to be a drummer. So I did like it. If you don't like music or don't like drums, you probably won't like this movie either. Uh, it is on Netflix, so you can watch it on Netflix now. Uh, yeah, and those are our recommendations for today. All right. Well, I guess uh, with that, I guess it's time to to wrap up. Um, thank you all for listening to Documentary First, where we believe everyone has a story to tell, and you can be the one to tell it. Yes, you can. Bye, everybody. <laughs>